So hey guys, um, guys, if you have never seen these videos before, we do these MagMod live chats with uh, influencers or photographers that are just absolutely out there killing it. Um, Justin Haugen is who I'll be talking to today. He's an incredible photographer. He's been very active in the MagMod community and doing lots of stuff. Um, again, for those who haven't seen me do one of these yet, uh, my name is Trevor Daly. I'm with MagMod. Uh, we've done, this is our fifth one. And we're actually a few days or about a week after, depending on kind of how our schedule's going, uh, we'll take these live chats and we'll throw them up on YouTube as well so people can rewatch them um, later on. And if you guys have questions during the live chat, feel free to post those in the thread and we'll try to address some of those questions as well. Um, and if we can't address them during the chat, uh, myself or Justin will we'll jump in there and, and look at them over the next couple of days and address any questions you guys have. So with that, I'm excited to announce uh, or introduce Justin Haugen. Justin, how you doing, man? Hey, I'm good. The weather's nice today. I'm here in Tucson. I'm kind of wondering why I'm just not in the office uh, doing this with you, but uh, I'm cool doing it on the computer if that works for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what Justin's referring to is MagMod. Our office is in Tucson, Arizona as well. Justin's a photographer out this way. Um, so yeah, we're only about 10 miles apart, but uh, but we're doing it this way just so, just so everyone can get the Facebook live chat. We don't have to bump each other and, and look at each other up close. And <laughs> so... Works I guess you me. still see me up close, right? Still yeah, your close. eyes are beautiful, man. <laughs> I'm like, your face is right here in front of me. It's a little, it's a little odd. I've never talked to you this close, even in person. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Awesome. Well, hey, Justin, again, appreciate you being here. So um, as I mentioned, guys, we, we've asked Justin to come on, share about five or six images, talk about those photos, and, and just basically give us some knowledge right share his knowledge with us on how he can you know we can use magma modifiers in our work and because you're, you're actually you've been killing it justin i love i love the way you've been using the modifiers and been following your stuff and uh so excited to hear what you got to say so thanks and I, you know i really got to give credit to the group uh there's been so many incredible photographers who are sharing like awesome work and i would be lying if i said i wasn't influenced by it uh especially like like easton and laura were just on and i did some photos on a recent uh wedding that i i actually tagged them in the post and said hey guys i'm giving i'm paying homage to easton and laura here because i, I completely was influenced by their photo where they they um i think it was easton shot with the snoot shot the groom in the reflection of a of a portrait on the wall that had gla a glass yeah. um, cover on it, I totally pulled that. Yeah. I did it, and I can't do that without uh, without giving credit to them because it feels like I'm I'm it's derivative of what I've seen them do. So the group has been wildly influential on what I'm shooting, and I think it's starting. You know, it's great to see what people will share, and then people will be influenced by it, and then they take it to the next level, and everyone's just keeping increasingly getting better. So that's what I love the group for. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Justin, I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be saying the same thing about you because you've, you've had a lot of influence on people there. Um, one thing, I, I get to check analytics of the group and kind of see who's who's commenting and liking stuff just to kind of see, you know, where the active people are, I guess you could say, and thank them. And, and you're one of those people that I got to thank because you're, you're one of our top two most active people in that community. So I really appreciate all the time you spend in there and help people out. <laughs> that's a mixed bag for me it means i spend too much time on facebook but at least i'm trying to leave positivity in my wake while i'm on it I'm, I'm trying to convince myself that this is all for a greater good no that's awesome well we appreciate it for sure so great well, with that why don't you share some of that knowledge and and uh i know you have some photos that you picked out and i got to see a few of them and they're absolutely stunning i know that there's one that uh i've seen you post in the group before and i'm sure a lot of people have been curious how you shot it um let's start with that one it's the one with the ski ball machine is that cool? All right. Yep. I'll share my screen here. All right. So this first image here, let me go full screen. Uh, so this was shot in a putt putt golf arcade place called called um, Golf and Stuff, and we had to call in advance and get permission to shoot here. Uh, we paid like fifty dollars just to be on on the grounds and shooting. And the other thing about it is, not only are we shooting. This session here, there are people here playing games and there with their families. I think we were there like around on a Saturday at like two o'clock, which is like the peak busy time. And yeah. so the great thing about working with speed lights, and I'm, I'm using it in this photo, I've got a nano stand, which is the Manfrotto, the small collapsible ones that'll fit, they'll collapse down real small. Um, I've got the speed light on top of that, it's collapsed all the way down, and there's a spear on it. And this photo is backlit by the spear um, and uh, the speed light, the spear. And Working in the space, it's really tight, 
and I've got machine. I had an arcade machine to my back, and I was literally backed up against it, trying to get as wide of a shot as possible, so I can get as much of the uh, of the scene in the photo. I think yeah. I shot this with a with a twenty four millimeter with lens. And the other part about it is not only are the are the games, you know, it is a space tight. People are playing playing games, and their families are walking around. So our footprint has to be really small. Uh, I'm very big about when I'm in venues and there are other patrons. Uh, uh, patronizing the, you know, making use of the facilities that I'm not interfering with guest experience. Cause that's a big part of the, um, like, that's why venues will want to continue to work with you. If you cannot interfere yeah. with the other guests at a venue and you can be there quick and small and not noticeable, they really appreciate that. I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and it's amazing. You know, they'll, they'll mention that to you. They'll say, Hey, you're so easy to work with you. You know, like you said, you keep a small footprint. I mean, and something like that, at yeah, Saturday at 2 o'clock, there's no way that you'd be able to bring big stands and, you know, and large soft boxes or big umbrellas or anything like that. And in and, and this situation, nor would you want to, because basically it looks like by using that mag sphere behind them, you essentially created a rim light that looks very natural. It looks like it literally came from those ski ball machines, maybe from that bright blue one on the left-hand side, for example. Um, I'm assuming that's what kind of what you're going for. Is that right? Yeah, and I'd like to augment the light in the scene. I, I'm going to throw this term around a lot, uh, intuitive lighting. I want the light to be intuitive to the scene. And there's another member, Cammy, and I can't pronounce her last name, but she does really incredible work. She's out in Florida. And she used the word reference lighting in a photo that I shared last week or, or this weekend. And I like that idea of reference light. Like I'm augmenting, I'm doing an assist to the light in the scene, uh, but mm -hmm. that the light coming from those machines isn't enough to rim light them the way that the spear would. So when I place that spear on the skee ball machine and point it up at them, I'm, I'm pushing the light a little further uh, to give a little more of a rim rim light look to it and keeping it intuitive to the light in the scene. It doesn't look like it doesn't seem that obvious that I'm using that light and I want it to be kind yeah. of, I, I want to hide that a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and Justin, for those who aren't familiar with rim light, what would be your purpose for putting a rim light in this scene? Why would you just not shoot it with just the regular ambient light? Um, the reason I use rim light is to give separation to a background. And this might not be the most obvious lit, rim lit situation. Usually it's, you'd want to pop, you want to add a rim light when you have a very dark background and say your subjects have very dark hair there, the hair doesn't, the hair will tend to blend and the shaded areas of the photo will blend into the dark black background. And so mm -hmm. when you add a rim light, you get that, just that highlight, that kiss of light around the outer edge. It outlines their body in white basically, or whatever mm -hmm. color your light happens to be. And it gives them just that little bit of pop, that separation and three dimensionality from their backdrop. Yeah, no, that's exactly why I use it as well. It's just to give that little bit of separation. Um, and, and surprisingly, there's some other benefits to it in that a lot of times that rim light will go past, will bounce, you know, with, you know, it could be the arcade machine behind you or the window behind you and just fill in just a tad bit of the shadows um, on their face as well. A lot of times that's what I'll see, depending on where the location is. But, uh, but yeah, that separation is the number one. Uh, the number one deal there to get that just that tiny bit of separation makes that I like I like the word three dimensionality that was a good word <laughs> and and I don't want to um I don't want to delve into this other image too long I just want to show it as a as an assist to uh my point yeah here. I'll show you yeah, what it. we were just talking about where you get that front fill from light that spills and so this mm -hmm. photo was unintentionally filled in on the bride and groom so I shot this backlit with a grid and you'll notice that the outer edges of the of the trees in the foreground, the bushes in the foreground are lit up. And not only was I rim lighting those bushes, those bushes were filling in the bride and groom. And so the, mm -hmm. they they this, you know, typically when you shoot a rim light, you're going to get a silhouette situation. But when I push the exposure up a little bit in post, I noticed quickly they had a really great fill onto them. And not only that, if you look at the light on his cheekbone where his where the groom's eye is, the light from her face is pushing onto his face. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. No, I appreciate you sharing that example as well. Thank you so Great. much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, let's let's just go down the line there. What's the next image there that you have in uh, the blue shot? Yeah, let's bring that one up. Okay. And so uh, this should I, I, should I go ahead I, and talk, or do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you the one thing that really stands out for this image for me is. Um, you know, one thing I talk to a lot of photographers about is when you're creating a photograph, you're looking for contrast, whether it be contrast of light, 
contrast of, you know, a conceptual contrast, like maybe an old hand with a very young hand, like a old grandma holding a new baby, for example, that would be a conceptual contrast. And then, and then this one, it has the color contrast. Basically you got this cool colors versus the warm colors, which really makes this image stand out to me. Uh, that's the first thing that I notice about it. Um, is that what you're going for? Or tell us, maybe, maybe tell us your thought as you're building this shot. Sure. And so at this point, we're kind of getting into twilight. I get not is it twilight, the, the time right after the sun drops below the horizon. Yeah, the and civil so get, twilight. Yeah. Yeah. So we start to get a little bit of a, a bluer tone in our shadows. And I'm very big on using gels. It's a big part of how I shoot. And in this photo, I think I was using a half CTO gel to warm them up a little bit. And when you color uh -huh. correct for your subjects and that warm CTO gel that you put on them, uh, you will push your ambient hues to a bluer, a cooler temperature um, when they show in your pick final results. So I like to play with the idea of color theory in that warmer tones tend to come forward and bluer tones tend to recess. And so there's a little bit of this three, like again, the three dimensionality at play here. So while we have these big foreground blue foreground elements in the front, we have this orange, orangish subject in the background, but they're kind of, they're kind of at odds with each other. And we're bringing them for those subjects further back forward in the picture because of the color dominance of orange versus blue. Yeah, no, I, I love how you explain that. That's a, that's a great way to look at it. And, and you're right. You, you want to have that kind of that color theory in mind when you're using whether it be the, the standard gels, the correction gels, or even the you know, color gels to kind of complement the different colors in the scene. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us, you mentioned about you know, pushing your colors, for example. Are you doing, are you doing uh, Kelvin white balance in camera? Is that what you're doing? So everyone always asks me this because I, I, when I share my images, I always, I always put, put what gel I was using and it throws people for a loop. I'll say I used a full G CTO gel and I'm making the assumption that people understand that I'm color correcting for that CTO gel in post. Mm -hmm. And so people always ask, what was your white balance set to? And a lot of times I'll keep it on auto. I'll keep it on daylight, but I okay. will change. I will change it in camera strictly for reference because when I'm looking at it on camera, I'd like to see it in a correct way. So in this one, I believe I was probably set to tungsten or I may have rolled a, rolled back the um, custom Kelvin to like 3300 Kelvin yeah. to to nullify the orangish hues and make them their skin tones look more natural. Yeah. So I only do it in camera as a reference, but honestly I could shoot the whole day at auto and not never even worry about it. I know when I get back to the computer that I am going to correct for the skin tones of my subjects, and I and I already know the result. When I shot this, I could have shot it at like ten thousand uh, white balance uh, Kelvin, and I still would have known that I was going for this result in post. But it does take yeah. a lot of practice shooting in custom Kelvin and shooting uh, with gels, knowing knowing these color properties that it's, what it's going to look like later. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I like the way you said that just as long as people know, and, and, and this is kind of old news. I mean, people have been, been shooting this way for years now, but as long as they shoot in raw, because if they shoot in JPEG, then you don't yeah. have that white balance control later on in post. But um, for those who are interested, if you guys uh, kind of want to learn more about white balance, um, gosh, it was three or four years ago, but I wrote an article on F-stoppers. If you just search Google F-stoppers, uh, white balance, Kelvin, Trevor, or something like that. Uh, you're bound to pull up an article that kind of talks about it, but but you're right, uh, Justin. You could obviously you could shoot this like you said at auto, and then and then knowing that you have orange light, you know, you said this was a, a mag sphere and a mag grid. Is that right? Um, I believe. Gosh, I want to say it was just a grid. Just a grid. And so yeah. so knowing knowing that you have that that gel that you're pushing orange light on them, then you know that it's gonna basically the rest of your scene is not going to have that light. And so when they're balanced correctly, then everything else is going to be the opposite, which is that blue color. Um, and then just, just for reference, you have your light on the right hand side over the wall. Is that correct? Kind of by where that tree branch is sort of. So I'm at the base of some stairs here in the foot, in the very front bottom of the photo. And if you go up those stairs and hang a right, that's where my flash is, is tucked behind that wall pointed at them. Gotcha. Did you have to do any Photoshop work to remove a stand or anything like that? No, it's hidden by the wall. I always try to hide stuff before I start thinking about compositing and having it in the scene and then removing it later. I try to do my best yeah. to like use the scenery to my advantage and hide things. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. It's so much easier, right? So absolutely. Very cool. 
Well, I love that shot. I, the other thing that I think really stands out with this shot is the lines. So you have the lines from the roof, you know, coming right into, you know, the groom and the bride's head. You got the line from the right, you got the lines from the wall. Um, you got all these lines kind of leading, you know, converging. And so it works really well. Nicely done. Thank you. Thanks. I'm big about leading lines. I really do. I really like to have things leading to my subjects if I can help it. I, I don't yeah. I don't do as well in uh, wide open spaces where there's no um, no architecture or structure for reference. So I, I, when, I, when you put me in a place that's really busy, it's actually to my advantage versus being out in the open. No, I get you. Well, and I think one other thing that stands out, and I think it's worth mentioning is in this shot, you have that clean space right behind their heads, too. Um, had you been just a little bit lower and their heads went through the line of the roof, it, you wouldn't have that such clean space right there. And so you, you got, you know, you just for those who you know are, are trying to study photographs and learn how to become better photographers and what to look for, that clean space behind your subject like that is, is something that's really important, you know, just to help them stand out with all these lines crossing in, in their in their heads. So, yeah, again, and I well tend done. to do a lot of. I tend to do a lot of one light work and I'm looking at this picture now I'm like, man, how would I improve this image? I'd probably kick throw in a rim light to, to give a little separation from their heads and that dark space behind them. But, you know, you know, in retrospect, it, it, it's po yeah. well, it's possible, but, but his head, it, it, there's a, there's just enough um, different shades of, of blacks there that make him stand out just enough that it doesn't blend uh, entirely. Gotcha. And, and I, I get what you're saying. I mean, it could, possibly but i don't think it was necessarily needed i, I think it works the way I, I i know it works i love it it's one of my favorite images and, of yours and it might change the mood if i threw a rim light in too so i have to consider that the mood of the photo could be completely different yeah. that's true that's true awesome stuff do you, do you have another one there you can share with us yep. i'm loving this so i just shot this one oh. on the weekend oh and by the way just justin i should probably mention for those who are watching you guys um we uh, the, the chat, the questions that come in on the chat, if they do come in, we uh, it's hard to sometimes see them as they're updating. So if you guys have any particular questions, um, we'll post it and then I'll, I'll see if we can see it. And then like I said, worst case scenario, we'll catch it after the, the broadcast. And then for those um, interested, it looks like Adam asked the question is, is if we're gonna put this on YouTube and we will put it on YouTube, it will be there. So. Uh, we record these and it can sometimes take a week, but we'll get it up there and that way you guys can rewatch as, as well later. So, sorry about that, Justin. No problem. So tell us about this shot at the Rialto. So I shot this last weekend on Saturday at a wedding and this one's actually a composite. So I'll explain how I shot it and uh, how, how anyone, anyone else can also replicate this type of shot if they have somebody's help with them. Uh, so basically um, I've got, on the original plate for this image, like the first shot that I did, just to the left of them, maybe within like five to seven feet, was my assistant, uh, Brandon Mendez, and he's in the group too. And he was holding a um, my light stand with a speed light on the end of it, and it had a grid and a spear. And that's one of my favorite combinations, my favorite um, modifiers to use, because you get that very discernible circular light pattern and the light fall off is very noticeable i love i love how it'll hit them and then fall off towards the bottom of their feet for the bottom of their body and so mm -hmm. we um, i shot one photo handheld i didn't use a tripod for this you don't need a tripod so i had him i took a picture and i got them properly exposed and then i told him to run and he 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 booked it to the left of the photo and, and walked out of the scene so the light so hit the light that he had wouldn't affect them and i took a second shot with no flash going off. And so now I had a background plate and I had I had this photo with the proper exposure from the speed light on them and I layered them in Photoshop. And you can align them, you can you can you can select both layers and and go to edit align layers and it'll automatically line them up for you. And then you just mask away the space where the uh, assistant is and it'll reveal the under layer which is the which is the shot without the assistant in it and then you can merge them together and get one clean photo yeah and the benefit to doing that is basically you know if you had shot this with brandon in there and you tried to you know clone him out he might have been standing right where those signs are or right where the structure is and it would have been difficult to have to rebuild that information or rebuild that sign especially if it's not there so Absolutely. yeah i, I uh, you're absolutely right. It's so nice to get that what they call a plate shot, and then that way you you have something you can build off of. Um, yeah. And the important thing is, I didn't use a tripod, 
Sorry, what were you saying? No, I was just say that's rad. I, I'm I'm with you. I, I hate carrying tripods and stuffs around. It's like it's like one more piece of gear that you have to carry with you. So if you can do it without it, even better, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So shoot it and then have them run. And and that's not really that's not anyone's technique. Like that's pretty common knowledge. But I did see um, Sal Sincata and uh, Michael Anthony. Um, they really use that that type of work to great effect. And uh, they had a they had a uh, they had an event here recently in Tucson, and and I get to see it at work a lot. They do it a lot in their work, and it's a really great way to get the light that you want on your subjects, but then get them out of the scene. Because otherwise, I'd probably shoot this with like a 135 millimeter lens across the street, and I would just be doing like a vertical portrait of the bride and groom, and I wouldn't even have the assistant in the frame. But I love environmental portraiture. I love showing um, my my subjects in a place. Uh, referencing where they're at and a lot of these couples they pay a lot of money to be at really cool venues and really interesting places and they want to see that so while it's not the prominent feature of the work and I do some more traditional portraiture and some closer up portraits I love shooting environmental portraiture this stuff is my favorite stuff to shoot yeah well I think what what, what you're so good at Justin is you're you're great at being able to take the flash and the the ambient light that's in the scene already and just kind of combine the two and, and mix them together which just so happens to be this month's theme I don't know if you've entered any photos into it but um the, I didn't I didn't the theme I, thought, I thought it'd be go ahead what oh I didn't I just I didn't I, I figured I'd let everyone else do their thing and see what great work there was coming into the group so uh, you, I guess what you're saying is you're going to throw down your Pokemon card right at the last day. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm kind of sizing everyone up, and I'm going to pick <laughs> pick my last image at the end of it all. I'll play my trump card. <laughs> trump card. I, I don't even know if Pokemon card is – I don't even know if that's a thing. I, I know what I'm trying <laughs> to say. No, but, uh, yeah, that's that's one thing you're really good at is you're, you're great at, at the balance that flash and that ambient light to, to basically, like you said, tell the story of your clients, which is fantastic. So, yeah, love it, dude. You think about – Think about this image. If you were to not use flash, what would we doing? What would we be doing to get the proper exposure on our subjects? We'd probably just be correcting poor exposure on them, and we'd be upping the exposure as much as we can, and probably blowing out all these all these wonderful lights and colors in the process if we wanted to just expose for them. You know, so when we're shooting without speed lights, we're kind of losing the we're losing some of those options to get great light on our subjects and maintain the light in the scene. And that's a big part of why I shoot the speed lights. Yeah. Well, and, and making it look natural with with shadows and things like that. I mean, if you were to do this in post, you would either take hours and hours and hours to get this perfect light, you know, exposure on them, you know, basically dodging the the light around them. Or you're going to have this terrible looking vignette, um, you know, where you're you're balancing everything ambient wise, everything looks good. And then you got this terrible light vignette on them. Um, so I, I love it. I love how you use flash there to basically get it right. You know, so thank you. Awesome stuff. What other shots do you have there? Just you can share with us. All right. Yes, this was from a wedding wedding. Uh, I think in November I shot this wedding. So I'm very big on very simple light setups. Um, if and in this photo in particular, I used a background light. So I have a either a purple. I think her favorite color was purple or magenta gel in a in a spear, and it's on the ground on a table, maybe about 40 feet behind them at the end of this long dining hall. And I pointed it upright at about 45 degree angle. I pull out the diffusion panel on the flash to get a wider spread because I really want to hit all the edges of the sphere. And I want to throw this colored light throughout the entire venue. And that's that's my first light. I want to I want to build that light up, um, add some drama to the scene. The next light I have. So just, is, just to, so Justin, just to recap, it's one light behind them with a purple gel filter and a sphere. Is that right? Yep. And at a 45 degree angle, sure. pointed upward toward the ceiling. Okay. And I wanted that light to reach as far as it could in the scene. The next photo, the next light that I use is to the left of them. I have on a um, on a speed uh, on a stand. I have a speed light with a grid and a spear. Again, that's one of my favorite combinations of light modifier is a grid plus spear. And that I had. I may have had a full CTO gel on that. I think it may have been ungelled. Now that I look at the ambient light in the scene from the tungsten lighting, it's still pretty orange. So I may have been ungelled on that flash. And mm -hmm. 
the the thing about this photo that I'm really happy about it is I only needed one light to light both the subjects. There's a little bit of separation between them and I'm very big on short lighting. And it, uh, if you're not familiar with short lighting, that's where uh, the subject is posed in the direction of the light source. And you, you get that light fall off, that shadow that falls off the wide side of their most present part of their face. So if you look at the right side of each of their faces, you've got this dramatic shadow that's that's falling off. And why that's, why that's advantageous for um, your photography is like, your couples, you don't get to pick your couples. And sometimes everybody comes with different body types. And I can tell you this, nine times out of 10, uh, brides and grooms with larger body types will love having short light because you can shed pounds in camera. So call short light your skinny light. It's a really good light source to work with. Yeah, you know, and I it, just as an example, Justin, if you look to your left just a little bit, that window light, it's now, now you're short lit right there. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with lighting patterns, that's kind of an example of, of that short lighting. I, and, and you're right, in this shot, you know, I, I, everything you said about short light is exactly right. I, I like, I've never used the word skinny term, but I, I'm gonna have to start, or skinny <laughs> light, but I'm gonna start using that. Yeah, and, and I, planned my, I planned my lighting setup today. Uh, Trevor worked me through it. So I actually did sit here intentionally to give myself the best light on my face. So I could just- Yeah, I was gonna say you look about 20 pounds, look about 20 pounds skinnier there. Are you, are you sitting <laughs> in front of a right skinny now. window light? Is that I am a skinny <laughs> light. But um, so oh, that's awesome. The other part about this lighting setup is I, I tend to get a little stale in my posing and I'm trying to work better posing so that I get both my subjects short light, but also have their bodies be in different directions. So sometimes like when I do this type of photo, I'll do prom pose. I'll have the groom behind the bride. They'd both be standing and both their faces would be the direction of the of the short light. But in this photo, I sat the bride down, I turned her body to the right and I brought her face back left toward the light. So she still got short light on her face, but her body is turned normally. You'd be If her face was to the right, you'd have broad light on her face and we'd be, we'd be filling in her cheek on the closest side of the camera so i i'm really getting big about dynamically posing my couples to where they both get short light but their bodies might not be in the same direction yeah intuitive dynamic three-dimensionality i like all these words i feel like my <laughs> vocabulary is just like going through the roof <laughs> i love it and then make these words up they're already awesome. there <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome it's a great shot justin i appreciate you sharing that one Thank you. Very let's, much. uh, yeah, thanks for telling us about it. Let's, let's, what else you got there? Let's, well, I, I'm going to see if we can get through as many of these as we can, just because I, I know a lot of people are learning some good stuff from them. Great. Okay. I'll go to this next one. Uh, we can talk very quickly about it. So I love big backlit scenes. I love putting as much light as I can everywhere. Um, in this photo I was in, I was in Charleston, South Carolina at uh, Magnolia Plantation and Gardens. And it was the last photo of the night. They really wanted to go see this big Spanish uh, or oak tree with Spanish moss hanging off of it. And they wanted a romantic like rimlet picture. They even told me like, we love how you do rimlet photos. They didn't say rimlet, like those backlit photos. And we want the something like that, this tree. Yeah. yeah, the silhouette. They're really, uh, it's, it used to be like, I used to do it a lot, heavily, where it was like the most notable thing about my work. And so I was happy to take them out there and do this shot. So the thing about this photo is the setup is how do you light this huge scene with this giant, giant tree with a small speed light? And so what I did in this photo is uh, I think we went purple gel again. You'll see a lot of purple gelled background lights in my photos. I always ask the bride what's their favorite color and purple comes up a lot. And I put a purple gel in a spear. And again, I pulled that diffusion, wide wide angle diffusion panel out the front of the, the head of the speed light. There's a little panel you can pull out that mm -hmm. makes the spread of light greater. So I put that, pulled that out, put the spear on it with a purple gel. And now the important part about this photo of how I can light this humongous tree, I'm shooting at 24 millimeters uh, and I'm probably a good, I'd say like 40 feet from them uh, to get this much of the tree in the shot and them that small. I put that light maybe a hundred feet back and you can see there's a tree in the background that it's, that's, that's getting a lot of that light on it too, way at the bottom of the photo. So I pointed yeah. that, that speed and I had a nano stand at the speed light pointed up 45 degrees uh, with the spear and the purple gel. And now the hard part is how do you get that light all the way to the furthest edges of the scene and get all this great 
uh, light scattering around. So my flash was probably half power, maybe even full power in this shot. I'm shooting at ISO 5000 at F1.4. And, and that oh, wow. was the only, the only way I could get all of that light to reach the furthest edges of the scene and be discernible in the photo. Uh, if I had shot it at a lower ISO, you wouldn't see the outer edges lit up as they are right now. And so it was a big scene, small light, and I got the light to hit everywhere I wanted it to hit. So basically you're, you're increasing your ISO enough that it was so sensitive, you're able to pull in even the, the smallest of areas where that purple light was hitting, essentially. Yes, yep. And so that's cool. It's, one way, and you couldn't do this during the daytime, of course, um, it'd be a totally different idea. But, you know, at nighttime, I've got to take, you can, your speed lights become really bright at night because you can increase the efficiency of the flash by raising the sensitivity of your ISO or opening up your aperture. So that's yeah. how to get more light out of a small light. That light's 100 feet away. It's all I needed for this huge scene. No, oh, that's rad, man. So was there any anything in post that you did to the shot that you know that you know anything major in post like any any changes did you have to get rid of the light or anything like that no the light's so far away that you couldn't even see it um i may have done a little bit of highlight bringing down the highlights just a little bit because there's there's some pretty bright parts that were close to being blown out uh, the closer they are to gotcha. the flash uh and then i didn't you know and, and i wanted to keep the contrast very stark so i i didn't do any shadow adjustment where i'm pushing back detail into the scene i'm, I'm trying to keep it pretty much all values of this purple light and just black gotcha um one one person tori i'm not sure if uh if this was on this image or the previous image but uh she asked what height did you have the stand um let's just not go off this image all. like on the silhouette yeah, and the silhouettes you typically keep it like probably just below their waist there. So I'm guessing like maybe three feet or so. Yeah, um, maybe about three feet. It wouldn't be fully extended, just enough to like obscure it with their bodies. And the previous photo too, it probably wasn't more than like three feet off the ground, just enough to where you can like if you drop down low enough that you can you can hide the stand behind their bodies. Yeah. Well, now when you say previous photo, the one that you shot where you had them short lit, that one you probably had up nine or ten feet. Is that correct? Oh, I'm talking about the back, the rear back light, the purple light. Though it's way back, oh, 40 the feet behind light. them on a table. Oh, okay. oh no, no, the, gotcha. uh, the 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 one just before. Yeah, it was. Yeah, pretty much. I keep them low all the time. They're never up high if they're if they're um, a backlight situation like this. Yeah, but when they're front lit, how high do you normally use your flashes? If you were just to pick an average. So my light stands. Um, I have these Savage drop stands that have the collapsible legs. Uh, they only go uh -huh. seven feet. I didn't, but I might get the nine foot version soon because I feel like that's probably my ideal height. But um, I'm up usually about uh -huh. seven feet max, unless I have an assistant okay. who can lift the light up higher. Gotcha. Perfect. No, that's good. Good information. Very cool. Well, we appreciate you sharing that shot. What uh, What else do you have for us there? Okay. Well, I'll talk the snoot because I don't think the snoot gets a lot of love, so I want to give it a little love here. <laughs> well, so, and I, I think what's so interesting about this shot, Justin, is that you use the snoot in a way that I don't think a lot of people would even think to use it. Like, like in other words, it looks so natural there. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely interested in how you created this. Great. And so uh, he's leaning against the wall, and normally in these situations, and and I have the light parallel to the wall, maybe about ten feet away to the left of him. So it's just out of frame, parallel to the wall, pointed at his face. And I had to delicately place that light so I wouldn't get any spill along the wall. Otherwise, you'd feather the light onto the wall and you'd see like this laser, you know, lit up area of the wall leading to its face. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted just his face getting a kiss of light to accent his face. Yeah. And so normally when we do this, we'd probably we're probably carrying our grids and maybe we'll have we'll go a double stack grid or maybe even a triple stack grid and we'd probably bring our subject off that wall and have him standing maybe like three feet in front of the wall so that way none of the spill from the from the grids from the speed light would reach the wall but in this case because the snoot uh fully extended is such pinpoint light that I can I could pull this off parallel to the wall. He's he's on the wall and and it adds a different dynamic to his posing. He's kind of relaxed. He's kind of like co contemplative. He's thinking about walking the aisle here in a little bit with his bride. And I just wanted him to kind of like have a moment to himself. And 
you know, leaning against the wall was complimentary to that. So pulling them off the wall would have given me a different photo and I couldn't have pulled this off without the snoot. I love how you said that too, because you're right. If, if he would have been standing off the wall, he wouldn't have had that kind of leaning up against the wall, thinking about what's about to happen, you know, how his life's about to change and that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then, and then, and then the, so the snoot, essentially the reason you chose the snoot versus like the grid is that if you had used the grid here, that light would have, kind of brushed up against the wall as well. And and you would have been obvious kind of that some kind of artificial light was being used. So by using the snoot, you're able to get that really pinpoint focus on your light. Is that is that correct? Am I interpreting that right? Absolutely. And I think that's the thing that people need to know about the MagMod system is that uh, what, what changed my photography and how I shoot off camera light using the system is that I learned that I want to put light only where I determine I want the light. It used to be in the beginning, I wanted to have big soft light, huge modifiers, octas and umbrellas and PLMs, all these big modifiers that make very soft. Um, I love the quality of soft light. But now I'm really all about dynamic, intuitive, intentional lighting. I want to put the light exactly where I want it. I didn't want it on the wall. I only wanted it on his face. And there's a tool for that. And it's the yeah. suit. Do you, do you find that using Magbot has made you more creative as a photographer? Absolutely. Um, it's like it's like being a painter and you've got a multitude of bush, uh, uh, brushes and paints in your toolbox and you get to pick any every tool that you need for the job is right there for me. Um, different tools give me different results. And not only that, I'm in and out of my setup so quickly that I can bring all and it's small, it's portable, it's interchangeable very yeah. quickly. And I think you know, you get some naysayers on other other groups who who are like who, you know, down talk maybe either the cost or the utility of these of these modifiers. And I completely think they're coming from a place of uh, of naivety because they don't know how useful it is to me on, as a professional on a wedding day when I'm shooting. Uh, I got to provide a multitude of looks in different settings all over a venue that I may or may not have a full um knowledge of like what I really like about the place. And I got to make snap judgments about, I walk in this place, what's the light look like? What's the mood of the people? And I'm navigating all these different things. And the last thing I want is my tools to be an obstacle to my creative vision. I want it to assist me, not hinder me. And it takes yeah. time, it takes practice, and it takes investment to get this stuff and use it and then see it start to change and sculpt your work in a different way. And, and I credit the last year and a half of my growth and development to fully uh, immersing myself into using these modifiers and then going out of my comfort zone and using a modifier that I may not have as much experience with, like the snoot or the beam and telling myself today, I'm going to use this and, and I'm going to make it work. Yeah, no, I, I love how you say that. Justin, if you if you ever uh, decide you don't want to be a photographer anymore, you ought to become like a college photography instructor. Because <laughs> because the way the way you teach and the way you think about things and the way you explain kind of your process and what's going through your mind or how things are helping you or how certain tools, it's uh, you do a really good job at it. So. Thank you. You know, and, um, and I I wish I'd had somebody who could like put their arm around me when I was doing all this and navigating my way through using off camera light who could have made it a little more sense to me, like make make a little more sense of it all to me. I, I found all this stuff out by trial and error and making mistakes and seeing what didn't work and then being influenced by all the great photographers in the Magmod group. So it definitely, yeah. it takes time. Oh, that's awesome though. I, I And you're right. It is nice to have somebody there to help out. And I think that's what you're doing right now for so many people in the community is just by being there and, you know, expressing your opinion and, or, or I should say helping them by, by sharing your, thoughts and opinions and everything else in the group. So, uh, so again, thank you for that. Um, Justin, we're just about out of time. Can you maybe pick one more image that you could share with all of us and, and, uh, we'll kind of wrap on that one there. Okay. Um, let's see. I have a lot of images. Or, or if there's, or if there's two that maybe complement each other. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do this because I haven't showed two cool. lights. Well, let's see. You can just look at it for a second. I'll think is that about the it. same couple that is, is the orange is the orange one the one that you're on right now is that the same one as the blue one right next to it like is it the it same is. couple same couple maybe can we can we maybe you can tell us a little bit about each one of those images and why you chose to do is that cool okay yeah oh well, you know what can we talk about the beam we didn't talk about the beam 
Absolutely. I would never keep you from talking about the beam. <laughs> Let's of go course. beam. You were you were here this day, and I think it's a great it's a great example of how powerful the beam is. Well, at least yeah, let's do it. Powerful is wrong. How how efficient it makes your light. So, um, when uh, Shutterfest did a Project Lunacy workshop here in Tucson, and we got to go out to the the plain boneyard, the graveyard here over here. Actually, this is the Pima Air and Space Museum, and we everyone got to bring out model. There was models. Everyone got to, to group up the models, and uh, we had this objective of playing with the mag beam this day to show how great it can be in certain lighting situations, and. There's nothing harsher. Well, I'm sure there's something harsher, but Tucson sun at noon is probably the least favorable light for any photographer. Everybody, every photographer in Tucson probably only wants to work before 10 o'clock or after three, but nobody wants to work midday because of light, like light and the scene. And I'll show you the next photo. This is the shot without, without the mag beam. So this is strictly natural light, uh, high noon light. We're probably right at, right at 12 o'clock when I shot this. And yeah. so no, I remember uh, and not only that, but it was an extremely windy, dusty day. <laughs> very dusty, yeah. Windy. <laughs> like like uh, and on a windy day, the last thing you want to do is pull out your umbrellas, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh and Trevor Trevor gave me a little hint here about how he likes to use a beam. He puts it up high, maybe ten feet high, uh, angled downward at their subject. And in this case, you know, you're working with a model, it's not out of order, it's not it's not out of the question to see them posing upward toward the light source. So again, I like this short light. You see the lights dropping off at her jawline. And I was really obsessed with this idea of bringing the ambient down as low as possible and then introducing the beam in order to, um, to short light in broad daylight. So I wanted to, sh I wanted to light her in this light, but be, but have the light be my light, not the sunlight. And so when we got back to this image, I'm shooting at one two hundredth of a second at F11 at ISO 50 with my camera. And not only that, in order to kill this ambient even further, because two hundredth of a second at ISO 50 in this daylight is still pretty bright, uh, even at F16, F11 and F16. So at F, I, I can't remember why I zoned in on F11, but it had to be how it played with my um, eight-step neutral density filter. So not only was I at F11 at ISO 50, I had an eight-step neutral density filter really trying to kill this ambient light. And so when you're looking through the camera, it's dark. You can barely see your subject. And the exposure, you'll see the darkest parts of the image. That's what this image looked like. Then I bring in the mag beam and light her up. I think we're at full power on the mag beam, maybe half power, probably full power. Yeah, I think full power. And I, I lit it where it hit just her face and it actually reached a little bit of the parachute. I had to, I had to burn the, the dress a little bit so it didn't look too lit up. But I was able to light her, I was able to short light her in broad daylight in with everything I was trying to do to kill the ambient light in the scene. And that's with the speed light. I think it's incredible you can do that. Yeah, I um, I agree with you. And and the interesting thing is, um, it, when you said the neutral density filter, you're talking about a neutral density filter over your lens. Over right? the lens, yeah. Wanna, I was trying to cut the light. Yeah, yeah. I just want to confirm for some people, you know, if they if they think about neutral, because we have the neutral density filter gel, the ND gel, basically. Um, but that wasn't used here. That was this is you're you're putting as much light as you can with the mag beam, pushing it. And you said your f11 one two hundredth of a second. ISO, ISO 50. 50 with an ND eight stop. With Is an ND right? eight step, eight eight step, not wow. eight stop. It's uh, which I think oh, cuts, eight step. Okay. Which I think which I think cuts uh two and a half step stops of light. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not okay. I'm not fully sure. I'm okay. not. I, that's uh, style, that's style still that's, this that's pretty. Yeah, no, that's incredibly impressive though to to be able to cut it down that much to make essentially. I I remember you're right. It was shot right around 12:30, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And you're basically darkening that sky down, you know, and then putting that light back on the model. And, and you know, it's funny. We were just kind of playing here. We were just kind of experimenting and playing. And I remember there was, in fact, you can kind of just barely see some people, their legs out in the back. Like there was a lot of stuff, a lot of people around us, signage, all kinds of stuff everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I look forward to seeing, you know, we'll have to go out and play again one of these days and do some more of that. Maybe kind of like in a cool environment where we have more environmental stuff to play with as well. Um, sure. And and to note, like if for our for our beginners out there, you couldn't typically do this with a speed light any other way without the beam. Uh, this is where you might want to bring in a large strobe 
Like he'd bring in a high powered strobe uh, to uh, a strobe light to bring in this much light and power into the scene and be able to do this to the ambient light. So this is not normally speed light territory. So the mag beam is very impressive in that way and that we can even light, light her up this much uh, and make the ambient that dark. Yeah, really collimating that light. And I think we have some behind the scenes. Maybe I can see if I can find a behind the scenes shot and post it in the thread of the video mm -hmm. so people can see. Um, I want to say the light was probably maybe, I want to say it was, was it like six feet away, eight feet away, maybe six feet away? And That's it was about, about eight feet nine away. feet, yeah. ten feet up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a little, it wasn't, it wasn't like right outside the frame. Um, it was a little ways away. So, um, very cool. And then the nice thing is, is like I said, it was so windy, but we didn't really have to worry about holding the stand and stuff. It was, um, yeah. in fact, I remember stepping back and, and doing something. So good no stuff, sandbag, Justin. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Justin, this has been, this has been great, man. I really appreciate you taking that time. Um, you know, and going over these images and sharing them with everybody. And, um, let me just check real quick just to make sure I know, uh, there's a few, uh, questions that had popped up and guys, Unfortunately, when, when Facebook is doing these live broadcasts, the chat doesn't stay up. It like doesn't, uh, it's kind of a funky thing, but like a comment will pop up and then it will go away if, if I don't see it right away. So, so occasionally I'll miss these comments. So if you guys do have a comment, um, keep in mind that about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes after this Facebook live broadcast ends, uh, Facebook will post all those comments again. It's kind of a funky thing. I don't know why they don't show all the comments at one time, but for some reason they don't. Um, so we'll be able to see those and be able to comment on them. And, and uh, Justin, I guess uh, just to kind of finish things out, where could people find out more about your work or, or how can they find you on Facebook or Instagram, website, that kind of stuff? Uh, so you can find my website at justinhaugen.com. My last name is H-A-U-G-E-N. Um, I'm also at justin underscore haugen underscore photography on Instagram. And then you can find me on Facebook. Uh, if you go facebook.com forward slash Justin photos with an S on the end. So those are the three awesome. ways to find me. Uh, and then, of course, we hope to keep seeing you in the Magma community. <laughs> um, yeah, at this rate, I'm sure I'll be there for a lifetime here. Um, I just want to say, if any of you guys are making it out to WPPI uh, next month and you see me on the expo floor, say hi to me. I'd love to talk shop and see the work that you guys are shooting and uh, and answer any questions about the Magma stuff. We can maybe walk over to the booth and uh, and try to direct you towards your first part of the kit or you know find you some, some new to toys to play with. You know, we, we need to do some kind of shoot or something when we're there. We need to we need to set something up. It, it would be a lot of fun to get get a bunch of users together and do some kind of shoot. I mean, granted, we're all going to have you know, there's going to be 50 light stands pointing at somebody, but uh, but but dang, it would be a lot of fun. So we'll have to, I'd like we'll to see how many lights, out. like the most amount of lights we can get gridded on one subject for one simultaneous photo, like get everybody in the same channel. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you know what we need to do? We need to do one big group photo. So let's say we get 50 people and, and every flash has a snoot aiming at one person. <laughs> I like that idea. We should do that. <laughs> Just for no other reason that people can laugh at us and say, what in the world are you guys doing? <laughs> no, but, uh, well, hey, Justin, seriously, thank you so much for taking the time, man. I really do appreciate it. I know others do as well. And, and uh, guys, again, if you have any questions, Justin will um, check out the, the thread over the next couple of days. Just every once in a while, peek in there and see if you guys have any questions and help you out. And, I'm happy to do the same. So thank you again, Justin. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. All right. Take care, bud. Bye-bye.